Welcome back to the evolution of Karnak Temple. In this final part, I'll cover construction at Karnak from the reign of Amenhotep III to the Ptolemaic period. Amenhotep III was the son of Tutmos IV. He ruled Egypt for 37 years, between approximately 1386 and 1349 BCE. It was a time of great prosperity and artistic splendor. Amenhotep III expanded Karnak by building the third pylon and started construction on the 10th pylon. Also, now found at Karnak, is the Keper Scarab of Amenhotep III. There's also some controversy over whether or not he built the central colonnade now found in the Hypostyle Hall. Here's where Amenhotep III's two pylons were located. By this time, the processional way toward Luxor Temple was nearing completion. The main temple of Karnak was still only about half its final size. Amenhotep III began the 10th pylon along the south processional way, but only the lower courses were completed before his death. Some 50 years later, Pharaoh Horemheb finished the monument and added sandstone walls connecting it to Hatshepsut's 8th pylon. Here's how the 10th pylon looks today. Amenhotep III tore down Tutmos II's festival court, which was located in front of the fourth pylon, and he removed the obelisk of Tutmos II, which had been erected by Hatshepsut. Remember that infamous third pylon? The pylon full of blocks stolen from construction by previous pharaohs? Well, Amenhotep III was the thief. His third pylon replaced Tutmos II's earlier pylon. Amenhotep III recorded that this pylon was decorated with gold and silver, brought back from his Nubian campaign. However, because of an earthquake in the late 1800s CE, only the lower parts of the once towering structure of the third pylon remain today. The antiquity service cleared up the rubble soon after the earthquake and discovered that inside the pylon were over 900 pieces of 11 other monuments, such as the Red Chapel of Hatshepsut and the White Chapel of Sinusrit I. On the northeast face of the third pylon is a depiction of Amun's river barge called Uzerhet. It was used to transport the holy bark of the god back from Luxor Temple. Texts tell us it was richly adorned from stem to stern with silver and gold, and that the shrine on board which held the statue of the god was made of electrum. 700 years later, during the reign of Taharqa, this giant scarab statue was brought to Karnak from Amenhotep III's mortuary temple on the West Bank. No visit to Karnak would be complete without stopping by to see the scarab. Just look for the horde of tourists walking in circles around it. Local guides tell women that circling this statue seven times clockwise will enhance their fertility. But they never mention what might happen if the scarab is circled counterclockwise, as these women are doing. There's currently discussion among scholars as to who really built the central colonnade of the Hypostyle Hall at Karnak, just in front of Amenhotep III's pylon. The columns look similar to Amenhotep III's colonnade at Luxor Temple, and the column bases at Karnak on the central aisle are made of recycled material dated to before Amenhotep's reign. Was it built by Amenhotep III or Seti I? It'll take further research to determine just when the Hypostyle Hall's central colonnade was erected. Amenhotep III's son, Amenhotep IV, was one of the most enigmatic pharaohs in Egyptian history. This king is shown as Amenhotep IV in the statue on the left, now in the Louvre Museum. In the fifth year of his reign, he changed his name to Akhenaten, moved Egypt's capital 250 miles downriver to Amarna, and abandoned Karnak and the worship of Amun. Today, his reign is known as the Amarna period, when a new religion and new art forms were introduced, such as seen in the bizarre depiction of Akhenaten on the right. As Pharaoh Amenhotep IV, at Karnak, he completed the decoration on the third pylon built by his father and added a courtyard dedicated to his wife Nefertiti in front of the temple. Just east of the precinct of Amun, he also added four temples dedicated to the Aten, a manifestation of the sun disk had been worshiped for some time. 
His new religion was based on the Aten as the one God. He's been called the first monotheistic ruler in history. The left photo shows a section of the third pylon, now in the open air museum, which has the added image of Amenhotep IV in the traditional pose of smiting his enemies. The drawing on the right highlights the remains of his cartouche. But as you can see in the left picture, his cartouche and the king's figure were damaged by the priests of the moon in retribution for Akhenaten's switch to only worshiping the Aten. Recent work at Karnak by the French team has determined that Akhenaten built a double peristyle court dedicated to Nefertiti. It was located in front of the temple's entrance at the third pylon, but almost no trace of it remains today. The foundations and knocked down walls of Akhenaten's temples at Karnak were located in the 1920s just east of the unique obelisk. On the right is a plan of the Jempa Aten Temple, meaning the sun disk is found, with hundreds of operating tables in its open court. It was built just to the north of Akhenaten's other three temples behind Karnak. The Jempa Aten was fronted with a colonnade of square pillars, against which rested colossal statues of King Akhenaten. Carved and painted decoration on the walls behind this colonnade depicted the king and queen entering the palace and presenting offerings to the Aten. The complex was enclosed with a mud brick wall about 25 feet in height. In the Luxor Museum is a reconstructed wall from the Jempa Aten found inside the ninth pylon built by Horemheb. It's made of talatat blocks. The temple was constructed with talatat blocks, 21 inches long, 10 inches wide and 10 inches deep. They were created so that a single man could lift and carry them. This block, found by Flinders Petrie and Howard Carter, shows 16 of the Aten Temple's offering tables piled high with flowers, bread loaves, and dishes of burning incense. The trust cattle below are waiting to be sacrificed. 30 of Akhenaten's broken colossal statues were buried when the Jempa Aten was abandoned. Here's what they looked like when found in 1926. Two of the Jempa Aten's colossal statues are now in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Akhenaten built the Jempa Aten in the third year of his reign to celebrate his Hebsed Jubilee. This was 27 years earlier than tradition dictated. What can I say? He was a strange character indeed. By year six of his reign, Akhenaten had abandoned Thebes and moved the court and royal palace to Akhetat, a brand new city in Middle Egypt modern Tel El Amarna. Today, here's the view toward the area where Akhenaten's four Karnak temples once stood. There's not much left, is there? Tutankhamun, perhaps the son of Akhenaten, is of course the most famous pharaoh of ancient Egypt, thanks to the discovery of his almost intact tomb in 1922. To quote Canadian Steve Martin, King Tut, he gave his life for tourism. Other than setting up his restoration stela, modifying an avenue of sphinxes on the South Processional Way, and leaving a few statues, Tutankhamun did little building at Karnak. Between Karnak and Mut's temple, there's an impressive avenue some 1,500 feet long, lined with 150 ram-headed sphinxes. They were originally human-headed and created with alternate images of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. Tutankhamun had their heads lopped off and replaced with ram's heads as part of his return to worshiping Amun. Traces of Tutankhamun's cartouches still remain. An important stela found in the debris at Karnak was Tutankhamun's restoration stela. The text records how temples of Egypt had fallen into ruin during Akhenaten's reign and how Tutankhamun had restored them to their former glory. The perforations down the center from a later attempt to split the stela in half. This statue of Tutankhamun was found in the Karnak Cachette. It's now on display in the Luxor Museum. There's also a couple of statues at Karnak that are attributed to Tutankhamun and his wife, Ankesenamun, based on their facial features. Neferhotep was the chief scribe of Amun during the reign of Tutankhamun. He left this painting on his tomb wall showing the entrance to Karnak Temple. It shows an access canal was constructed to allow boat landings just in front of the temple's entrance pylons. And this canal was moved further and further west 
as new entrance pylons were built in front of the temple. After Tut's untimely and perhaps mysterious death, he was succeeded by his aged vizier, I. I only ruled a brief four years, and he in turn was succeeded by General Horemheb, commander in chief of the army. Horemheb was the last pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. He demolished the monuments of Akhenaten, built the second pylon, the ninth pylon, and finished building Amenhotep III's 10th pylon. The second pylon at Karnak significantly extended the temple towards the west. Ancient Egyptians called the temple's main entrance the Ruti Werti, or the Great Doors. These doorways were some 90 feet in height, 24 feet wide, but probably could not be opened as their weight would have exceeded 10 tons. So smaller doors, some 30 feet high, were fitted within the Great Doors. These doors pivoted in sockets drilled into the door sill. The second pylon is decorated with scenes of King Horemheb and the Company of the Gods. The pylon's original height is unknown, but the bases of the towers were 150 feet long and 48 feet wide. The pylon later became the western wall of Seti I's hypostyle hall. Horemheb also built the ninth pylon along the south processional way. It's currently being reconstructed. Amenhotep III's 10th pylon is the last one encountered on the South Processional Way, heading toward Luxor Temple. The upper portion of the 10th pylon, the part later finished by Horemheb, was filled with Talatat blocks from Akhenaten's Karnak temples. Remember those Talatat blocks in the Luxor Museum from Akhenaten's Jempa'aten Temple? As shown in the lecture picture, Horemheb used them to build his 9th pylon and complete Amenhotep III's 10th pylon. Hormhead died childless, and he selected his vizier, Ramses I, to succeed him as pharaoh. Ramses I became the first king of the 19th dynasty, and his reign was a very short two years. He's shown in this scene from his tomb, offering to the god Nefertin. There's no evidence of him building at Karnak. Ramses I's son, Seti I, followed as the next pharaoh. Seti I was a warrior king who fought wars in the Levant, Nubia, and Libya. His greatest achievement was the capture of the town of Kadesh from Egypt's Hittite rivals. But after withdrawing from Syria, however, the Hittites recaptured Kadesh. A few years later, Seti I's son, Ramses II, would be back trying to retake the city once again. Ruling for over a decade, Seti undertook massive building projects at Karnak the construction of the amazing hypostyle hall in between the second and third pylons. Seti also inscribed battle scenes on the exterior of the hypostyle hall, northern enclosure wall. The hypostyle hall is a huge multi-column and roof structure filled with 134 gigantic stone columns which support the stone ceiling and clerestory windows. The middle columns, perhaps the ones built by Amenhotep III, are 33 feet in circumference and 80 feet high. The hall itself covers an area of 50,000 square feet. Its inscriptions were recorded by a team led by Egyptologist Peter Brand from the University of Memphis. Dr. Brand spoke to the ESS in Denver in 2016 about his work at Karnak. The North and South Hypostyle Hall enclosure walls are covered with carved reliefs. The interior scenes show the temple's foundation ceremony and the daily rituals I mentioned previously. There's also some unusual scenes like this depiction of cutting down the cedars of Lebanon. The north exterior wall shows Seti I in battle scenes against the Libyans and the Hittites. The next king, Ramses II, known as Ramses the Great, was one of Egypt's most powerful pharaohs was the oldest son of Seti I. It's pretty well known today, mainly because, as stated by Egyptologist Elizabeth Blay, and I quote, his self-publicity knew no bounds, end quote. Although Ramses II had many massive building projects throughout Egypt, he made only modest changes at Karnak. He added his own battle scenes, an Eastern temple, a pair of obelisks, and he recarved his name all over Seti's hypostyle hall. 
Ramses added two obelisks just to the east of the Karnak temple enclosure. And he built a small temple called Amun-Ra Ramses II, who hears prayers, just in front of the unique obelisk. The Karnak obelisk of Ramses II stood near Karnak Temple's eastern access gate. A small sphinx statue resting on a rose granite base originally fronted each obelisk. In modern times, shards of Ramses' broken obelisk were discovered in this area. But the only thing that can be seen today are the ruined support bases. Ramses' eastern temple may have functioned similarly to the Contra temple of Tutmos III in the common Egyptians could enter the temple complex here and pray to Amun-Ra. Ramses II completed the second pylon's decoration and replaced Horemheb's cartouches with his own. As you're probably well aware, Ramses had a habit of doing this. In the main temple, Ramses also changed some of the raised relief decorations completed during the reign of his father to the more familiar sunk relief that typifies the inscriptions of Ramses II. This is why Ramses is also known as the Great Chiseler. On the south exterior wall of the Hypostyle Hall, Ramses II carved the usual scene of his so-called victory at the Battle of Kadesh. Ramses II outlived many of his sons. It was his 13th son, Renepta, who followed as the next pharaoh. But other than recording his campaigns against the Sea Peoples on the east wall of the Keshet court, Merneptah did not build at Karnak. Merneptah's son, Seti II, became the fifth king of the 19th dynasty. Seti II built a triple bark shrine along the temple's east-west processional way. Seti II's bark shrine was built outside the second pylon, the western entrance at that time but later construction by Sheshonk I enclosed the shrine within the temple. It was built to hold the barks of the moon, Mut, and Khonsu. A small obelisk of Seti II is just on display in front of the first pylon. It's one of a pair. Currently, curiously, its inscriptions consist of repeating the king's name over and over again. They were apparently at a loss for words. The next construction of Karnak was done around a decade later by Ramses III, the second king of the next dynasty, the 20th. He was not related to Ramses II. Although Ramses III's reign was fraught with troubles, including an economic collapse, an assassination attempt, and an invasion by the Sea Peoples, he is considered to be the last great New Kingdom pharaoh. At Karnak, Ramses III constructed a new temple in front of the second pylon, and built a large temple dedicated to Khonsu in the southwest corner of the precinct of the moon. Ramses III's new temple has a small pylon inscribed with scenes of the king smiting his enemies, but he also put a triple bark shrine inside his new temple, which he located opposite the triple bark shrine previously erected by Seti II. Like Seti II's bark shrine, Ramses III's shrine was built to hold the barks of Mamun, Mut, and Khonsu. In the courtyard of this temple are 16 Osiride statues of Ramses III. There's also scenes of the Opet festival barges sailing on the Nile, returning from Luxor with individual boats holding the sacred barks of the Theban triad. Ramses III's temple of Khonsu at Karnak was constructed with large blank spaces on its walls. Successive pharaohs and the high priests of the moon eventually took care of those empty spaces and added their own names and scenes to its walls. You could call it royal graffiti, I suppose. Pharaohs Ramses IV through the VIII were weak kings who accomplished little during their reigns. Although Ramses IX ruled for some 18 years, he did not have many building projects as Egypt was in decline by the time of his reign. Ramses IX did add a new gateway between the third and fourth pylons along the main temple's southern wall it marked the entrance to the South Processional Way. The gate's southern exterior side and door jams were originally covered with texts and scenes in sunk relief. The scenes were part of the Theban festivals commemorating the barks of the gods Amun, Mut, and Khonsu as they passed through the gate during their journey out of the temple. By the 21st dynasty, around 1070 BCE, Egypt had fragmented into two kingdoms, 
and it entered the third intermediate period. While the 21st dynasty ruled from the area around the Delta, the high priests of Amun at Thebes, like Panegem, were the de facto rulers of the south. At Karnak Temple, Panegem placed some 100 ram-headed sphinxes along the west processional way, which stressed from the boat dock along the Nile to the temple's entrance at the second pylon. He also moved another 30 or so seated ram sphinxes to the entryway into the Khonsu Temple. The west entrance sphinxes probably came from Luxor Temple. They were originally carved during the reigns of Tutmos IV and Amenhotep III, and then later usurped by Ramses II in the 19th dynasty. Panegem shifted the sphinxes from Luxor to Karnak and added his name to them as well. This avenue of sphinxes leading into the temple along the west processional way was called the Way of the Rams. On these sphinxes, small Osirite statues inscribed by Ramses II stand between their front paws. At the temple today, 40 sphinxes grace the entrance to the first pylon and 52 are in the courtyard in front of the second pylon. The sphinxes in front of the temple of Khonsu are unique. They are seated rams, protecting an image of the king. They were originally inscribed by Amenhotep III, but later usurped by Panegem, who relocated them from the temple of Mut. This colossal statue, now in the first court, was also usurped by Panegem. It actually depicts Ramses II with his daughter, Bent Anta. Founder of the 22nd dynasty, Sheshonk I, chief of the Libyan Meshwesh, became commander of the Egyptian army after he married the daughter of the king of the previous dynasty. He reunited Egypt, but ruled from Bubastis in the Delta. In the scene on the left, carved into the walls of Karnak Temple, Sheshonk brags about conquering the cities of Israel. He's the same pharaoh called Shishak in the Bible, who carted Solomon's treasure back to Egypt. Karnak's Sheshonk court was located between the existing second pylon and the future site of the first pylon, which would be built 500 years later by Nectanabo. Sheshonk also built a small gateway on the southeast side of the courtyard. The Sheshonk court enclosed the earlier bark shrine of Seti II and Ramses III's temple. The majority of the court still exists today, only its west wall was demolished for later construction of the first pylon. A small gateway between the Ramses III temple and the second pylon is known as the Bubastite portal. Scenes on the south side of the wall, beside the Bubastite portal, show Sheshonk I smiting his enemies in Palestine. 156 name rings decorate the wall. These are symbols of bound captives and cities the king has defeated. The Sheshonk court was lined on its northern and southern sides with sandstone papyrus bud columns. The 25th dynasty began in 760 BCE, when Egypt was invaded by the Nubian kings ruling Kush, the land to the south of Egypt. Taharqa was the fourth pharaoh of the 25th dynasty and a devout worshiper of Amun. Ruling for 26 years, he built extensively in both Egypt and Nubia. At Karnak, Tarnak constructed a cult building called the Taharqa Edifice. A nilometer near the sacred lake added a kiosk in the Sheshon court and built a colonnade behind Ramses II's Eastern temple. The Taharqa edifice and Nilometer are located on the north side of the sacred lake. The edifice had rooms both above and below ground. It was used for rituals involving Amun-Ra's union with the power of the primal waters, symbolized by the sacred lake. Nilometers typically functioned as places where the level of the Nile could be measured. They consisted of either a well or a ramp with steps leading down into the water. The scale was marked in cubits carved on the wall beside the steps, which were used to measure the height of the Nile. An onk sign was carved in to indicate a good height of the expected annual Nile flood. Inscriptions though do not name Nile letters, but instead refer to their location, such as Behu Abu, or inundation at Elephantine. So perhaps there was no word in Egyptian for these devices? At Karnak, however, the Taharqa Nilometer seems to have served a ritual purpose. Taharqa was perhaps fixated on Nilometers because in year six of his rule, Egypt suffered a catastrophic flood which overwhelmed the land and the temples. On a stela, 
Taharka claimed he had been praying for floods in order to prevent famine. And he says, and I quote, but when they came, they penetrated the hills of upper Egypt, overtopped the mounds of lower Egypt, and the land became a primordial ocean, end quote. Taharka also erected an impressive limestone kiosk in the middle of the Sheshonk court. Two rows of five large open papyrus columns connected by low screen walls formed the freestanding structure. This meant that Penegem's Avenue Sphinxes had to be moved to the sides of the court where they still stand today. Only one complete column of Taharka's kiosk stands today. The function of the kiosk is unclear, but due to its position in the open air court, some scholars believe it functioned in the union of the disc ceremony. This annual ceremony entailed moving the cult statue of Amun-Ra out from his shrine into the sunlight to be re-energized. Taharka also built a colonnade just east of Ramses II's Eastern Temple. Here's what it looks like today. In 664 BCE, Samtik I defeated the Nubian rulers of the 25th dynasty and became the first king of the 26th dynasty. His reign of over half a century returned stability and prosperity to Egypt. The 26th dynasty ushered in the late period of Egyptian history. At Karnak, King Samtik constructed a storehouse in Avery, located on the south side of the sacred lake. Inscriptions found at the storehouse state that it functioned as a shenawab, a place for the preparation of the gods' daily meals. The building had a ramp which led down into the lake, allowing the sacred geese of the moon to enter and exit the water at will. Today, little remains of Somtic structure, except a hill beside the sacred lake. Here are two gods' wives of the moon from the 26th dynasty. The god's wife was a chief priestess of Karnak Temple. It was a position first created in the early 18th dynasty, but it fell into disuse until revived in the 25th and 26th dynasties. On the left is a relief of the god's wife of Amun, Nidocris I, daughter of Somtek I, from her chapel at Karnak. And on the right is a statue of Aunt Nes Nefer Ibre, Nidocris's successor as god's wife. Granddaughter of Somtek I, she was destined to be the last god's wife of Amun at Karnak. Hekor was the last king of the 29th dynasty. During his reign, he established a peace treaty with Athens and held off several attacks by the Persians with the help of Greek mercenaries. At Karnak, Hekor completed the work started by two previous kings on a small rectangular shrine just outside of the precinct of Amun. The shrine was used to house the portable bark of Amun-Ra on its journey along the West Processional Way. When the god returned from Luxor during the Opet Festival, or when he returned from the West Bank during the celebration of the beautiful Feast of the Valley. Here's what's left of it today. Nectanabo was the founder of the last native Egyptian dynasty, the 30th. He was an army general who came to power by usurping the throne before Hakor's son could become pharaoh. During his reign, the Greeks allied with the Persians to conquer Egypt, but their combined forces were held off at bay by Nectanabo. Nectanabo built the first pylon, an enclosure wall, an eastern entry gate, completed the temple of Opet, and extended the avenue of sphinxes from the Khonsu temple to the Luxor temple. Nectanabo's enclosure walls were massive constructions, 70 feet high and 40 feet thick. The enclosure walls probably served a twofold purpose. First, keeping out the floodwaters of the inundation, and second, creating a defensive compound to repel foreign invaders. An interesting detail in the construction of the walls is that they undulate using concave and convex bricks to symbolize the wavy waters surrounding the primeval mound. The walls were also originally castellated with defensive interior walkway built between the towers situated along the wall. Nectanabo's first pylon is Karnak Temple's main entrance today. The pylon though was never completed. If completed, these towers would have reached a height of about 130 feet. The gateway between the towers is 90 feet high and 24 feet wide. As on the second pylon, a smaller doorway was inserted into the gateway. Once again, imagine what it would have been like standing in front of a huge doorway covered with brightly painted figures adorned with silver and gold. 
When Karnak was first excavated in the 19th century CE, first pylon's construction ramp was still in place, stretching across the Sheshon courtyard. It was made of mud brick cross walls filled with debris. Most of the ramp was removed, but part of it is still in place on the southeast side of the first pylon. Used to make pylon flagpoles, tall Lebanese cedar trees were imported into Egypt from the Old Kingdom onwards. These trees can reach a height of 130 feet. They would have been an impressive addition to each of these giant pylons. The pennants on these flagpoles were symbolic for the hieroglyph Netcher, meaning God. An avenue of human-headed sphinxes was built between Karnak and Luxor Temple by King Nectanabo. This processional way is almost two miles long with some 1,400 sphinxes lining its sides. And this year, the um, processional way is being reopened. Nectanabo carved these words on the base of the sphinxes, and I quote, I built, there, built a beautiful road for my father, Amun bordered by walls, planted with trees and decorated with flowers to celebrate the Opet festival procession to Luxor Temple. The earliest part of the Opet Temple seems to date to Taharka, but its construction was finished by Nectanabo. Nectanabo also built a huge gate in his wall at the eastern entrance to Karnak. Here's a reconstruction of Karnak in the time of Nectanabo. By then, Karnak was nearly as complete as we see it today. In 332 BCE, Alexander the Great seized control of Egypt from the Persian overlord Darius III. After a six month stay, Alexander left to conquer nations to the east and became the absentee ruler of Egypt. When Alexander died in 323 BCE, his half brother, Philip Aridaeus, followed as absentee ruler. At this time, Alexander's generals divided up his empire, and Ptolemy was appointed satrap of Egypt. For the next 17 years, Ptolemy I governed in the name of the Macedonian kings. But in 305 BCE, Ptolemy I declared himself Pharaoh of Egypt. However, with all the foreign wars he was fighting, there was no time to be bothered with working at Karnak. But here's a summary of the work at Karnak by the following Ptolemaic kings. A new bark shrine was built in the name of Philip Aridaeus. Ptolemy III built the Khonsu Temple Gate. Ptolemy IV, the Osiris Catacombs, and the North Gate. Ptolemy VIII added the Tomb of Osiris in the Opet Temple, and an enclosure wall around Ramses II's Eastern Temple. Several kings over the millennia had replaced the central bark shrine with their own. The final shrine was constructed sometime during the reign of Philip Aridaeus. It was probably built while Ptolemy I governed in Philip's name. Inscriptions claim it was a faithful copy of the shrine built by Tutmos III. The pedestal for the holy bark is still in place today. This gate of Ptolemy III spans the southern entrance into the temple of Khonsu. Ptolemy IV's Osiris catacombs were partly above ground and partly below. They contain niches for burials, but unlike other sites that usually contain sacred animals, the catacombs were built just to house small statues of Osiris. Ptolemy IV also built the ceremonial gateway on the north side of Karnak, leading into the precinct of Montu. The Ptolemaic, Roman, Christian, and Islamic rulers who followed built their shrines, temples, churches, and mosques elsewhere, and Karnak was allowed to slip slowly into ruin, as seen in this photograph taken in 1857. While not a very accurate recreation, Hollywood theme parks like this one in Singapore are trying to show just how impressive these Egyptian temples were. The Karnak temple you can visit today has been cleared of centuries of debris and fallen blocks have been restacked in their original positions. It looks much better now than it did in 1857. I hope you get a chance to visit this fascinating place sometime in the future. As Bugs Bunny would say, that's all folks. Here's my main sources of information for this talk. There's a lot more information available in these references. Thanks for watching.